Good evening and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to our national virtual spark. Tonight we're going to be focusing on the topic of contracts. So type in your questions in the live chat as we go and we'll do our best to answer them after the presentation. Um, my name is Veronica Chan. And I'm the director of Spark at Freelancers Union. Spark is our nationwide monthly meetup event hosted by Freelancers Union that fosters community and creates space for freelancers to connect and learn together. Each month is centered around a different topic, and today our topic is all about contracts. So right now, we're in about eight cities across the U.S. and looking to build more. So if you're interested in building Spark in your city, then check out the Spark page on our website um, and scroll down towards the bottom, and then you can um, share your information and we'll follow up with you about that. Um, and for those of you who may not be familiar with Freelancers Union, we are a nonprofit organization that serves as a support system for independence through pu policy advocacy, benefits, online res resources, education, and community building events. So becoming a member of Freelancers Union is free, and we have more than half a million members nationwide across the U.S. So some of the many perks that we offer include curated health insurance plans, community-led networking and educational events like this, access to perks and discounts to products designed to level up your business, and also access to a free co-working space and, and also events there at the Freelancers Hub in Industry City in Sunset Park, New uh, Brooklyn, in New York City. So Freelancers Union has fought for and won protections for freelance workers, including the first of its kind Freelance Isn't Free Act, which gives freelancers unprecedented protection from non-payment and underpayment. We are here to fight to get you paid for your work and paid on time based on the terms of your contract. So today's talk is a really relevant one. So anyone that ha has had any clients who haven't paid or are late to pay, this is really the right uh, you know, spark to tune into. So we'll check out more details um, at, on Freelance Isn't Free um, to see if the legislation is passed in your city and state by going to the advocacy page on our website, um, uh, freelancersunion.org. So today we will be joined by Ray Khan and Gabe Estrada, the co-founding attorneys of Inflow Law Group. They are especially dedicated to serving creative prof professionals and content creators and they specialize in business compliance contracts and trademarks. So let's kick things off. Um, we're super excited to have Ray and Gabe with us. How are you guys doing? Great, Veronica. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we're uh, we're excited to to be here as part of the Spark. Um, and today we're we'll be talking about contracts. One of our favorite things to talk about, actually, as lawyers, as you know, may not be any surprise. But um, we really want to also just reshape what you might think of contracts. Uh, obviously, we work with a lot of creative professionals. We work with a lot of people who sometimes just, you know, handle their deals with a handshake and trust. Um, and although that's good in heart and good in nature, uh, sometimes it's just going to, you know, it's not the best business decision. Uh, and also not just to, contracts will help you get paid or just help you like be able to point to an agreement that you had with someone previously. But they really help you manage your relationships. And that's why we titled today's talk Contracts, the real relationship management tool, 
Because at the end of the day, contracts just help us set expectations for our relationships. And if you've ever been in a personal relationship or even your intimate relationships, having expectations with your per like your significant other is really helpful in making sure that you're all on the same page and you have a healthy relationship going forward. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, as far as like our law firm, we like to, to help our clients from the beginning to end, right? So it's really being there for, you know, not only just legal assistance when it comes to questions, um, but even to the point where we aid in, you know, some of these disputes and help our clients kind of manage those, you know, those disputes and the escalations um, that arise from a contract dispute. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah. And then, yeah. And just to piggyback back off that, a lot of times, you know, especially as lawyers, people come out to like reach out to us once an issue has already like popped up, right? Their client owes them money or something, you know, maybe their client breached the contract or maybe they're considered like concerned that they might breach the contract and other clients coming after them. Um, but really, if you're implementing contracts, that's what we call proactive, taking a proactive measure, a preventative measure. And that's the best time to actually work with an attorney or think about your contracts. It's before issues pop up, right? So even today, we had a, you know, one of our consultations that someone reached out to us, it was basically a client owed them money and they're asking like, hey, what, what can we do, right? And obviously there's things we can help them out with, but by looking at their contract, there's already some things that, you know, yes, they had a contract saying like, hey, the client's going to pay me. X amount per month for a year, but when the client stops paying, what happens then, right? And I, right off the bat, I was like, you know, if we have to redo this contract just so this doesn't happen in the future, I already have plenty of suggestions on how to improve this, right? Uh, things like implementing kill fees, you know, termination clauses, making sure that there's an exit strategy, right? So getting that proactive advice is so like quintessential, especially as a business owner, when trying to figure out what contracts you need, uh, and then all obviously other parts of your business that we'll get into. Right. But real quick, who are we, right? Uh, Gabe and I were the co-founders of Inflow Law Group, um, a, basically a law firm dedicated to creative entrepreneurs and content creators. Um, and basically, you know, how we got started was we looked at the fact that, you know, back in law school, me and Gabe actually met on like our first day of law school. Uh, Gabe was my first friend in law school, believe it or not. And um, we shared with the fact that we both went to law school because we wanted to help people, right? Um, and specifically, business owners, right? My mom was a business owner. Uh, my sister was a business owner. My mom owned a hair salon growing up. My sister owned a Froyo shop growing up. Gabe himself was a business owner and he's owned a tattoo shop for over 12 years now. Right. So we were very familiar with when being a small business owner that there's not many resources that you can reach out to, especially when it comes to the legality of doing business or compliance and doing business or contracts, whatever it may be. It's just a little difficult to you know, contact a lawyer um, sometimes it's just inaccessible or sometimes lawyers are just unapproachable and frankly unaffordable sometimes. Right. So we took a lot of those pillars and we wanted to basically create a firm that my mom could have reached out to. And, you know, that's where we got in full law group. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so just a little bit of, of history of, of us too, in our practice, um, after law school, we both wanted to, you know, help people. Um, and we did it in our own way. So early on, I was a public defender um, here in San Diego. So obviously, you know, helping people that couldn't afford um, legal representation on the criminal side. And then Ray started out um, in public policy with the local government, with the um, uh, helping with environmental policies. So again, our hearts come from, you know, helping people and really being able to give that proactive advice um, and trying to bridge that gap between, you know, attorneys and creators or small businesses. Um, and in that sense, being able to help them grow. Um, and kind of like the slide says, right? It's like we're, we're the, the punk rock version of, of the law firm, right? And that's what makes us so different is that we saw that there was some issues even in our legal community um, regarding, you know, high fees, the way that attorneys were interacting with their clients. To us, we felt we need to fix that and we needed to provide um, a way, again, that wouldn't be a conflict of interest if a client needed to reach out to us um, and get some legal advice early on without having to charge them beforehand, right? A lot of attorneys charge billable hours, big retainers. And we just saw that that was, that to us felt wrong. Um, we wanted to be able to provide low cost legal services um, that anybody could afford. So, yeah. Oh, and basically be able to work with 
whoever we wanted to work with. Yeah. People like ourselves, our friends who are doing really cool things, yeah. um, creative entrepreneurs that are building or freelancers just building really cool, yeah. innovative products and services for other people to utilize to make our communities better. And we just thought that was so much better than just working in house at, you know, some random environmental company or some random oil company, right? <laughs> uh, we just, that just wasn't us. We wanted to make sure that we were able to feel fulfilled by the people we were assisting. Um, and also to empower people like ourselves or like our parents um, who, you know, come, you know, my parents are immigrants and, you know, they came to this country and, you know, to basically gain that economic independence, they had to, you know, look to small business ownership. Um, and looking at the fact that, you know, bigger businesses, corporations and wealthy individuals, they don't use attorneys just to fix things when they need them. They use attorneys to help them, you know, game the system, to talk about strategy, to, you know, once again, understand what they can do and what they can't do and what they shouldn't do at the end of the day. Um, and we wanted to give that luxury and that privilege to people like ourselves, not ourselves, but fr our friends and stuff like that who are musicians or, you know, doing really cool videography work and not getting taken advantage of. So once again, just um, leveling the scales of justice between freelancers, content creators, talent, and the people who employ them to do projects. Um, so yeah, and the slide just kind of basically reiterates what we just mentioned. Um, but yeah, the reason we chose to work with creators are as freelancers and small business owners, because historically they just were neglected by the legal yeah. industry. The legal industry catered to whoever had the deepest pockets. And this is exactly why we see a lot of lawyers have these high astronomical, you know, hourly bills or hourly billing models um, that just makes it an obstacle for some of the smaller budget to reach out and gain access to just a small question they might have about, you know, am I setting up my LLC the right way? Um, am I in trouble if I do this? Yeah. And, you know, can my investor have a suit against me or anything right. like that? Right. Or just even reviewing contracts, right? I think in any industry, any creative industry, you're always going to be dealing with contracts from, you know, somebody contracting you or you contracting someone else. Um, and just to be able to give, you know, that legal perspective on, on a contract and looking for those red flags to, you know, again, prevent anybody from taking advantage of any, uh, you know, freelancers or, or, you know, small businesses. So diving right into it, what is a contract, right? So simply a, con a contract is an agreement between parties creating mutual obligations that are enforceable by law. Now, Beyond popular belief, do you need a contract to be in writing to be enforceable? No. A contract, once again, as the definition says, is just an agreement between parties. It doesn't say that it's a written agreement. Um, but why do us as lawyers and many people say you should get your contracts in writing is basically because it's evidence, right? You can't, it's hard sometimes to prove that someone verbally agreed with you, um, even though maybe their action, you can use their, you can point to their actions and stuff, but it's so much easier to point to, hey, your signature is on this page. You agree that I would paint your house for five hundred dollars, whatever, right? So it's so much better to have your contracts in writing, but it's not very necessary. Um, there's only certain contracts that absolutely necessary have to be in contracts. Like, for example, if you're a creative freelancer and you're a graphic designer, and if someone's hiring you for creating them a logo, well, if you're going to pass on the rights for them to use that as a trademark and have own that copyright, um, which they're probably anticipating. That needs to be signed over in a contract that can't be verbally agreed to that they have those rights. You, when you create that logo, you have the rights and that transfer is not complete unless that's in a signed document. Um, and also if you're on the receiving end, you want to make sure that if you're paying someone who's creating you any creative asset that you plan to use and, you know, exploit your, at your own will, you want to make sure that you have those rights in writing. So not only are contract great for you as a service provider, but they're great for you as a client as well. And that's one thing we just don't understand sometimes is like, some people don't like signing contracts, but as a client, you want your service provider to agree to the service they're providing and have their scope of services in a contract and also the rights you're getting when you do pay them, right? So as a client, it's to your benefit to have a contract. So sometimes that might just take convincing your clients, right? So, you know, a lot of times we have these questions pop up from our service provider clients saying like, hey, like my client doesn't want to sign a contract. And I'm just like, well, do, do they know that it's in their best interest to sign one? Because guess what? They're not going to own the rights to whatever you create them if it's not in a contract. Yeah. So that's just basically a good starting point for us. Um, and, you know, for the most part, we've seen businesses either do really well because they have great contract strategy or they do really bad because they don't have good contract strategy. Right. Just because you have a contract in place 
doesn't mean that it's going to protect you maybe the way you think it's going to protect you, especially nowadays with people just grabbing online templates and thinking they're covered with this online, you know, graphic design contract template they grabbed online, Mm -hmm. um, or maybe from a friend thinking that that's going to cover their bases. But, you know, sometimes it's incomplete. Sometimes it's missing the elements of how you do business and the policies you have in place and expectations you want to set with your client. Yeah. And, and you got to remember, um, anyone who's performing any services, right? Whether you are an LLC or not, you are a business as a freelancer, as a contractor, you personally are the business. Um, so you got to treat it as such. Right. Um, and a lot of the times it's, it's hard to, you know, to, to get in that flow. Right. A lot of the times, especially, um, you know, people that are working in the arts and, um, you know, creative industries, they tend to kind of just want to focus on, on their art, which they should. But at the same time, you got to remember you are a business. And like Ray said, if, if it does have some, some artistic value to it, whether you're a journalist or a designer, a graphic designer, it needs to be in writing in order to transfer that. And again, regardless of your entity, whether you're, you know, just kind of doing it on your own, you're still a business. And again, you got to treat it as such. Yeah. And I saw like, I think this was like on threads or Twitter or something. It was like a question about, you know, who, like, what's the difference between a business owner and a freelancer? And, you know, an easy answer is that all freelancers are business owners and technically not all business owners are freelancers, right? But at the end of the day, a freelancer is a business, you know, they, you're a business of one, um, or maybe you have, a team that's helping support you on the outside with contractors and things like that. But at the end of the day, you are a business. And mm-hmm. sometimes if you look at yourself as not, you're playing to, I'm not going to say lose, but you're playing not to win, right? You're playing not to lose and you're also playing not to win. But if you look at yourself as a business owner, you put yourself in a mindset of trying to play to win and making sure that, you know, you're protecting that stream of income, right? By having the right contracts in place, by protecting your IP, you're protecting these things that are your livelihood, yep. right? So your it's just, time. yeah. And it, right now, more than ever, it's the easiest to do that, right? Before, you know, you were able to be a freelancer and get paid well by a few clients. Uh, but now it's very competitive and there are a lot of tools that make it very easy to kind of build multiple streams of income as a one person solopreneur business. So it's really important to also, if you're going to be successful, to invest in understanding contracts and being empowered by them, not to be afraid by them, right. but to actually utilize them and leverage them, right? That's the biggest point I want to get across today. Right. Um, and mainly basically be on top of your timelines, right? So why do like a lot of contracts fail or like sometimes relationships fail is because there's a miscommunication on timelines, um, unclear payment terms, scope creep, issues regarding liability, intellectual property transfer has gone wrong, no exit strategy, strict restrictions, things we just list out that if you don't have a contract in place or if your contract doesn't be adequately addressed, then things are going to get messed up when it comes time, you know, when things just happen, right, in the relationship. Right. So, you know, we always relate, you know, I guess the easiest thing we're going to talk about this in a, soon, in a bit is that when freelancers talk about contracts, they immediately only think of their like client contract, they're not thinking about their collaboration contracts, their contractor contracts, um, and any other contracts that we might get into that might be touching your business that you need to be on top of. Because at the end of the day, all those relationships that you have with your contractors, with your clients, we want you to understand like, all right, this is almost like, especially if it's a long-term relationship, if it's like for a year or more, maybe even six months, um, think about it as like a prenuptial agreement, right? We always talk about if you're about to get married to this person what do you want to lay out what are the guidelines and understanding like hey you know if things go wrong right even when people get married things go wrong right there's ir- irreconcilable dif- differences that might pop up if things go wrong between you and your client how do we address that right let's think worst case scenario if we need to separate one day if we're going to go both our separate ways how do we make sure we both leave the relationship um, not pissed off at each other, right? That's what we want people to understand their partnership agreements, their client agreements, their collaboration agreements, whoever it may be, to make sure that they're managing their relationships well and using the contract as a tool to manage that relationship. Yep. So yeah, we're, we always talk about these four layers of defense, right? And basically four layers of protection that any business or anybody, you know, out there putting themselves, um, you know, as contractors need. Right. Um, the first layer of defense is contracts. Um, 
again, it's kind of self-explanatory, right? Because at the, at the beginning of that relationship, you're going to lay out all the guidelines, everything that's expected from both sides, right? It's not, it can't be one-sided. You want to make sure that the contracts are evenly, um, you know, split. It, it's going to talk about their expectations, your expectations, timelines, um, everything. So that way, if there is a dispute and there is a, a lawsuit potentially, right? Because that's the one remedy, I guess, out of a contract uh, breach, then first they're going to have to hit that contract, right? So that contract is your first line of defense, essentially to protect your personal assets, right? So that way, if there is a lawsuit, they can't go after your bank account, your cars, and, you know, your, your house. Um, so that's number one and probably the most important one. Now, if it gets past that, right? If it gets past the contract for some reason, then a second uh, kind of line of defense would be a business entity, right? A business entity would be like an LLC or a corporation. Now, obviously, a corporation has a lot of formalities, and we rarely recommend, especially anyone just kind of working solo, um, to ever become a corporation. Now, in some circumstances, it makes sense, but rarely would we ever advise to start a, a corporation because there's so many just big formalities that you have to do quarterly, yearly, and you get the same protection through an LLC. So let's just, for an example, let's use the LLC. So the LLC is another layer of protection because if, let's say, the lawsuit gets past the contract, right, and they, they find you liable for that breach of contract, then they still hit that other wall, which is the, the LLC. They have to sue the LLC. They can't sue you personally, as long as you're you're doing all the right formalities, right? Which we'll we'll talk about that. Like make sure that all the contracts are in the LLC's names, make sure your bank account is under the LLC name, you're not commingling funds, things like that. But let's say you're keeping a healthy LLC. Well, that's your second layer. So if a lawsuit does happen where there's a dispute, if you're at fault for the contract, then they're still going to hit the LLC and they're going to have to go after all the assets of the LLC before they could even think about going after your personal assets. Um, and then that brings me to the next layer, which is insurance. Even if it gets past the LLC somehow, right? That's why you want to have you know insurance. Now, insurance could vary depending on the business, depending on the the risk factors, right? Um, you know, sometimes if you're a brick and mortar store, like Ray said, I, I own a tattoo shop. Of course, a tattoo shop is very high risk, right? Someone could slip and fall. Someone could get hurt. There could be, you know, obviously we're they're dealing with with needles and blood, and you know, so obviously insurance is is necessary for that type of business. But let's say you're you're selling graphic designs on, you know, on Etsy or, you know, has a t-shirt company or something with kind of low risk of someone getting hurt or liability, then insurance, you know, might be something that you'd have to really, you know, think about if that's, if that's right for you. But just like any business, it's always good to have insurance. It legitimizes your business. Um, and it, again, it serves as a third layer of protection. And then the fourth layer that we always talk about is your brand protection, right? Whether that's you know your your name, your logos, or your your intellectual property, right? Whether that's your your designs, your graphic designs. Again, if if you're writing your 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 writings, your books, anything like that, you want to make sure you protect it. Make sure you own it, right? Uh, in order to give you all the the proper tools to go after someone if they infringe on your rights. Um, intellectual property is huge in contracts because like Ray said, intellectual property transfers need to be in writing, has to be. Um, and without that, you could, could imagine all the potential problems that you could run into, especially as a contractor, you know, although sometimes it ends up working in the contractor's favor because if there's no contract, somebody's using your your logo they don't pay you hey guess what you're still the owner of that of that logo and they can't use it without your permission so intellectual property is huge um and it is the the fourth layer of protection that we always talk about
Yeah. And our like quick little understanding of like what each of these do is like, you know, as the slide shows that contracts protect your business assets. So that's mainly going to be your cash, your bank accounts, right? Or any property you own, right? Your contract's going to say, hey, you know, on your time, also consider your time an asset as well. So your contracts are going to help protect your business assets. Insurance is going to help cover your business liabilities just in case if you ever, you know, if you are a graphic designer, maybe you didn't know, but you did infringe someone's copyright when you were making something for someone else, right? Now you're liable for that. Well, insurance could help cover that if you have what we call action, like, I think it's um, actions and omissions, sir. No, um, errors, errors and omissions. Errors. Yeah. Um, so that's going to cover, you know, things like that, basically your professional malpractice in that situation. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously your business entity is going to protect your personal assets from your business liabilities mm -hmm. if your insurance doesn't cover those business liabilities. And then your IP registrations, like your trademarks are going to protect your brand, your copyrights are going to protect your creative works. So going back to contracts, as Gabe mentioned, it's your first layer of protection. And also it's the easiest to implement, right? There's no need to, you know, starting an LLC, even though it's pretty easy today, um, it's still sometimes there's costs involved. Sometimes you might not be ready, like the right time for you to do that. Um, insurance can be costly as well. But contracts are an easy way to basically set expectations and manage a relationship before it even gets to being a liability, right? So how do people usually mess up these contracts, right? And right off the bat, other than not having them in writing, how do people mess up these contracts, right? Well, our first culprit is not being specific enough in their contracts. And this goes back to, sometimes using online templates or finding contracts you might have gotten from HoneyBook or your CRM or from a friend, uh, not being specific enough to the way you do your work. And a big culprit that we always see is, and this might be present in your current contract, is the services section, right? The scope of services, whatever you may call it, description of services in your contract. Um, it's not clear enough, right? And Contracts being vague or overbroad are just like the most common issue of problems happening down the line, right? If, for example, recently we saw a contract that just said service provider will be providing like videography services to the client. Well, that's great. Like we probably would could tell that like, <laughs> easily by the fact that they're called like videography company or whatever, right? Um, or just like a description from their website that they do videography services. We obviously know that's what's happening, but what exactly are the deliverables? What exactly, how much time are they putting into it? Are they showing up for shoot dates? You know, things like that. What exactly are they doing, right? So if your contract is just saying we're doing videography services, what type, like, what are, what's the project, first of all? Like, what does the client need? What are you delivering to them? What, you know, if you're caught, like, if it's not an hourly, you know, retainer that you're billing against, uh, is it a flat fee and what's included in that flat fee? Yeah. You know, if you're offering revisions, how many revisions are you, like rounds of revisions are you offering mm -hmm. before you start billing for those revisions, either by a flat rate per revision or hourly for each revision you do, right? These are important things to have up front because at the end of the day, whether you're the client or whether you're the service provider and you go back and there's an issue, right? You're going to point to the contract. You're going to be like, you didn't provide the services. And it's like, we did provide the services, right? We were going to do 10 hours of videography. And the client's like, I thought you were going to do 12, right? Like, and so that's where issues obviously come up is just miscommunication. So being able to have a thorough discussion with your client up front and then making sure a clear, concise, and well outlined basically scope of services is in the contract is going to take you so far because you're going to be able to save yourself. You're going to be like 80%, you're going to like already cut 80% of the future problems that you might have with clients just by having a detailed scope of work. Right. Uh, yeah. And I think uh, another one of those, those, you know, problematic clauses or lack of clause, um, a lot of times it has to do with the satisfaction of it, right? Um, not getting that really in the contract because look, what looks good to you, maybe to your client might not be what they're expecting, but that shouldn't be your fault. If you have on the contract that, you know, you're, you're, let's, let's just for the videography, that's probably the easiest example. You're going to do, you know, one hour or two hours of, you know, footage that you're going to shoot. You're going to do the edits. You're going to, you know, do the music. You're going to provide them with one draft and, you know, one re-edit or minor re-edits. And what does a minor re-edit look like? Well, maybe changing you know, the time here or changing some caption here, but let's say they're like, no, we don't like the whole thing. 
Well, that's probably something that they should have researched early on because they're hiring you for your artistic abilities. They should have seen your style. They should have seen all that. And you already put in all the work and they can't just go back and say, nah, I don't like it. I don't want to pay you anymore because that's not your fault. So even just having that, like a satisfaction clause, you know, stating it, it's, it's not your satisfaction subjectively, right? It's basically providing the services that you're hiring me to do, period. You know, so that's yeah. that's a common common miss in contracts. Yeah, and you might be saying, oh, like I really don't want to, you know, spend every engagement I have with a client or a potential client writing up a whole new like outline of services I'm going to provide them. Well, this is the idea of like not just having one service agreement, but having multiple service agreements, right? Mm -hmm. If you offer, if you're a social media manager, right? And you offer three packages of the types of, you know, services you can provide a client, whether that's, you know, a bronze, silver and gold package, um, you know, with different like hours and different responsibilities tailored to each of them. Well, then you should have three service agreements, one for your bronze package, one for your gold package and one for your silver package. I don't know why I bounce around like that, but um yeah, that's exactly what you want. You want those three service agreements and each of those, you know, maybe it's even just looking at your sales page for these packages and just take like, you know, you already outlined it there. Might as well drop that into your service agreement. And that's the big thing. Sometimes we're just like, you know, sometimes our clients have a really detailed sales page saying like exactly what they're going to do, but it needs to be in the contract. They can't just say, oh, I'm providing social media manager services. And that's like, hey, just easily put that in your contract. Like that's just going to save you so much more because we can just... If we need to enforce the contract, we can just point to the contract. We don't need right. to point to a sales page that might not be, even exist anymore because, you know, now we're talking about like the past, right? When there's, uh, you might have like gotten rid of that sort of sales page or maybe updated it, right? Or maybe you don't even provide that service anymore. So it's important to be in the contract if we're going to enforce the contract, right? And yeah, have multiple different services, especially you have different packages or if you do just different services in general, right? If you're a media company or you're a media, like you, do media photography or videography, obviously your videography services agreement is going to look different than your photography agreement. And, you know, if you're going to manage someone's social media account also as well, that's obviously going to be different. So you should have different services packages like based on that. Getting more detail, maybe you also are going to work with, you know, maybe you're a retainer, right? Videographer. And you're just someone's basically go-to videographer for the content they need to shoot. Uh, whenever they need you over a long-term basis, well, that contract's going to look different than a flat fee agreement right. as well. So these are things you have to consider and make sure, you know, it's so much easier to just have those templates available at your disposal, right? Create your own personalized template yeah. saying like, hey, this is my videography retainer agreement and then have a videography flat fee agreement mm -hmm. and utilize which one you need to use when yeah. the client agrees to a certain like particular service. Yeah. So... You know, that's all how we talk about just basically everything we just discussed is basically the phenomenon that people call scope creep, right? When a client is unsure of what they're paying for, or maybe they overexpected what they're paying you and they keep asking you more questions or they keep asking you for more additional services under, like without understanding that they need to pay more for that. And sometimes as a service provider, especially if you're just starting out, you might acquiesce and you might continue to do more than you're being paid for to do because you don't want to you know, basically offend your client or lose your client. So um, you want to make sure that the scope is basically outlined correctly and they know that, right? Because once again, you know, it's hard sometimes to try to rein your client back in, but it's so much easier to just let them know up front with a de clear and detailed scope of work exactly what you're doing. So, yeah. Yeah. And then that especially goes back to, again, even going as detailed as like how many hours each thing or how many minutes each thing is going to is going to entail. Right. Um, it's OK to put that in a contract. It's OK to say, hey, I'm going to spend four hours editing and that's it. Right. Any any edits after that are going to cost you this much per hour. So it's OK to actually put you know, the, the time that it's going to take you to do something. Yeah. And we have to do this for our own contract, right? right. Especially when, whenever you're offering a flat fee service, right? It's hard to always predict. You can have a good understanding of how much time a certain service will take and what you're doing and putting a value on that and agreeing with that, with the client. Right. right. But then naturally when you're doing the service, it might take, 
longer because of special circumstances. So you want to outline exactly like what they're paying for. So we have to do this with like our trademark service package, right? Uh, sometimes when, you know, the first step in our package is doing a clearance search. And we have to make sure that the clearance, that the trademark they want to register is available to register. And it's not going to be infringement if we do pursue that registration, right? We don't want to get our clients in trouble. So we do a clearance search up front. But sometimes, and we have to say in our contract, right, this is one clearance search, right? If we need to do a different clearance search because your trademark is not available to register, then we need to come to a mutual agreement on what that additional clearance search, you know, value or yeah. price will be for us to do another one for a new trademark right. and move forward with that yeah. for registration, right? Yeah. And we learned that the hard way too. Yeah. Early on when we started, um, you know, offering trademark services. Yeah. It was like, you know, doing one search and it, it takes a long time to do the search because we have to clear, you know, the multiple categories. We have to do an in-depth look at anything similar. So it's not usually a direct infringement. Usually it's if anything is uh, similarly confusing. So it's a, it's a long process. And if it comes back negative, then the clients are like, okay, well, I have option B that I want it to go with. All right, cool. We'll, we'll do it for you. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. You know, it's, out of, you know, we want our client to be happy. So let's do this new search. Boom, 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 boom. Second search comes out negative. There's another brand over there. Well, now the client's like, well, I have these other three names that I have lined up, right? So then now all of a sudden it went from, you know, we were quoting them one search that takes us, you know, a long time. All of a sudden now we're doing five different searches until we could find the right one. So again, being upfront about that, being, you know, very clear um, is going to save you a lot of headaches and a lot of uncomfortable situations. Because like Ray said, at the end of the day, these are contracts are relationships. That's what they are. They're relationships on paper. And we always think of them as a positive thing, not a negative thing. So if a well, if you have a well-written contract, then the whole relationship is going to be more positive. Because even if it does go south, you could point to exactly what the options are, you know, when there's that breakdown. So, yeah. Yeah. And so very important. And once again, contracts are delivering things and you're going to just naturally update them over time, just based on your experience with your, yeah. you know, your clients. If you ever have, if you have a contract in place, it might not cover every issue that might pop up. But if that issue pops up, you can then say, Hey, I don't want that issue to happen in the future. Or I want my client to know like how we're going to handle that issue in the future if it does pop up. So we're not arguing how to handle it. Right. So let me address that, put that in my contract. So if it does pop up in the future, we have guidelines on how to move forward. So for example, with our contract now, it says, Hey, this is for the first search. If, if the search comes back negative and you want us to pursue another search, that's going to cost this amount. Um, and that's just was that wasn't there to begin with, but over time we included that just so we can better preserve yeah. our time and then better you know give the client yeah. expectation of what they, and then they are okay with that. They understand the value yeah. there. So and and it puts you in the position of of power as far as what you're going to provide to them. So most of the time we'll do a second search at no cost, but even though the contract says they're going to charge them. Nine times out of 10, we're going to be like, no, it's fine. We'll we'll help you with that additional search. But at least it puts us in a position where if it does get a little abusive, you know, as far as like the, the searches, we're able to kind of put a, a stop to it and say, well, look, actually the contract says this. So again, it just, it's, it makes it easier for you to run your, your business or, or your, you know, your practice that way. Yeah. You can always, as you know, a party of the contract, you can always waive whatever right. duties or responsibilities the other part may owe to you, but you can never add on, right? If you add on, it has to be in writing. But it, you can always say like, hey, I'm supposed to charge you a penalty fee for, you know, not getting back to me in time. I'm not going to do that. I'll let you get away with it. And, you know, whatever, like out of the good uh, cooperation, like, you know, I'm not going to bring it up, right? No. Um, but if they do it a second time, you can always enforce it later on. So um, it's totally up to you. It gives you that power. So it's better to have that power than lack it in general so so other than not having it in writing and other than not having a clear defined scope of work and clear you know contract in general how else do people mess up contracts mm -hmm. oh also by not signing them um <laughs> uh, by not utilizing enough types of contracts so going back to the fact where we talked about before a lot of creative clients think they only need a services agreement right for them 
and their own clients. That's not true, right? So depending on your practice and depending on what type of business you're in, you might need many different types of contracts, right? If you are hiring contractors, you need independent contractor agreements with them. Um, and you know, independent contractors can mean multiple different things. Maybe you have a virtual assistant as an independent contractor. Well, that contract's gonna look a little different than your independent contractor that goes and you know takes photos for you of you for your social media. And maybe you have a video editor for your YouTube, right? And they'll, all those contractor agreements, if they don't have services agreements, you can always utilize an independent contractor agreement to make sure once again, the IP they're providing for you is you know thoroughly being transferred. Um, and also just making sure payment terms and everything else that needs to be in the contract is there in that independent contract agreement. Also your own services agreement, obviously. And then you might need some other contracts in place if you are co-hosting a podcast with another freelancer. That needs to be in writing about like, you know, you know, we're in a collaboration. This is how we could, this is how we collaborate together. You know, this is what we can spend individually. You know, if we're going to buy microphones and cool design and lights and stuff or a podcast studio, you know, how much money can I individually spend without approval from Gabe yeah. to do that, right? That needs to be laid out in that collaboration agreement. So yeah, collaboration agreements, especially are, are very important when it becomes, when they're creative collaboration agreements, because guess what? When you input your creative input into them, the other person puts another part of the creative input, it becomes one piece of intellectual property, right? Just think about just someone making a movie, right? All right, well, you got your director, they're putting in their 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 creative input. You got your your lighting, you know, person, they're putting in their creative input, right? You got your sound person, you got your actors, you got all these people that are bringing together, you know, to to create this one piece of work. Well, what happens to that piece of work if something breaks down, right? Who now owns that final piece of film, right? That's why it's important to have those those contracts, especially with collaborations, because you have to know if that you know if that breakup's going to happen, who gets to keep the IP? Are they splitting it? Are you sharing you know the royalties forever? Um, so all that could be in, uh, inputted into a contract, and those look different in many different ways. Right? Yeah. Obviously, if if for example, going back to the podcast, me and Gabe are hosting a podcast together. Um, Obviously, an agreement between us is important because that's a collaboration. But mm-hmm. between our podcast business and our guests, there also needs to be an agreement mm-hmm. there, right? Maybe a release so we could promote the podcast using their name, right? That might seem obvious, but we need that release because guess what? If we don't have the release of their name, image, and likeness to promote the podcast or even have the podcast hosted, mm-hmm. uh, they could they can make that an issue later down the line. Also, because they contributed to the podcast by speaking on it, right? Um, their words, and that makes them a joint owner to the copyright of the podcast episode they were on, right? So if they wanted to ask us to take it down in the future and say like, hey, I actually don't like that podcast. You know, we you did all that work. You spent a lot of money to, you know, finalize that podcast and put it up. Two weeks later, they'd say, can you please take that down? I just, I just, you know, I just wanted you to take it down. It's like, oh, do you have a reason? Like, is it, you know, did you say something you weren't supposed to say? No, I just don't like you guys anymore. I just want you to take it down, right? We probably would take it down because we don't. We probably wouldn't want that bad juju. But what if you did want to keep it up, right? What if it was doing really well and it was a, now an asset of your business? You would want to keep it up, probably, right? Um, and you'd want to at least have that decision, that power to make that decision. But hey, if one co, like one joint owner, was asking you to take it down, then you have to take it down. So that podcast guest release agreement should say something like, hey. You're going to sign over the copyrights you have to this podcast episode, which most guests understand that anyway. They probably anticipated that and thought that to begin with. But you want that clear transfer of that basically copyright ownership they have to it back to you as the host of the podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, And obviously the use of their like like image, likeness, audio file and everything, you need that as well. So these look different in many different ways. So going over, we basically laid out a quick diagram of like, if you were a single freelancer, what may your contract portfolio look like, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if one freelancer could have an NDA that they use whenever they're approaching a potential collaborator about an idea they have about, hey, Gabe, I have this idea for a podcast. I want to share you some sensitive information about the topics we can discuss, the name of it, and blah, 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 right? Whatever you may have. Um, You might want to sign, have them sign an NDA. So whatever you share with them, or maybe you want to feel comfortable sharing with them um, that they can't disclose 
or then go ahead and take your idea and do it themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the importance of an NDA and where the NDA comes in place. Um, maybe if you're working with a client, you have to share with them some certain information uh, before you actually sign a service agreement with like, its own confidentiality clause, then you use the NDA as well. Then following that, you have them sign your service agreement. Once again, setting expectations for services you provide your like a client. So a freelancer probably will have that. Again, they could also have an independent contractor agreement for any contractors or any team members that aren't employees sign. So the expectations are set between you as the client mm -hmm. and the pe per, like people providing you a service. Right. Um, maybe this freelancer also sells shirts online. Maybe they sell a digital product or an online course or a membership where they teach other people you know, how to do whatever skill set they have. Um, you're going to need a terms of sale for that, right? So if you are ever logging on to buy a course or sign up for a certain community or buy anything online, at the end, right before checkout, you're probably clicking on something that says, hey, I agree to the terms of sale and the refund policies and everything else that has to detail the transaction that's going on between you and that provider. That's what we call terms of sale, which is an e-contract. Uh, and then finally, that freelancer might also have a collaboration in place for whenever they're going to collaborate with, you know, maybe they're hosting a joint webinar and they want to make sure like, hey, who, how can we use this webinar? Who's using this webinar? Are you just a guest in the webinar? I'm the host. Basically set the expectations for the collaboration and how each party can use that collaboration going forward. Um, and in what way? So, yeah. and you got to remember contracts don't necessarily need to be, um, you know, something that sometimes both parties sign. So like, even for example, like your privacy policy, right? If you, if you are posting anything online, if you have any website, um, most states require a privacy policy, uh, especially if you're collecting any type of data, even just like a, a email, right. Or name and email. Just having that privacy policy in itself is a contract, right? It, it's basically letting the user know, hey, you're going to go on our website and you agree that we're going to collect this data. And here's, you know, here's how you could reach out if you don't want us to use that or if you want, you know, to see what we gather. So even just things like that, like, you know, terms of sale, terms of use, uh, privacy policies. Um, at its core, they they are all contracts, right? They're agreements between two parties, even though sometimes they're not actually signed. Um, but yeah, there's there's definitely a whole arsenal of of contracts that honestly any business or any freelancer or just any creator should honestly have. Yeah, and this is just a small snippet that you know, no. depending on what this freelancer is doing, they might also need model releases if they're taking photos of other people. They might need. Um, like a rental a liability waiver yeah, yeah rental rent. agreements right for mm -hmm. rental spaces so um, it could yeah. be a number of different things if you're like if you literally just teach yoga and you're you know having people come to the beach and doing yoga or whatever maybe you're taking someone on a hike to do yoga at a scenic area you have to get a liability rate waiver saying mm -hmm. like hey like we're going to be walking on uneven surfaces yoga is a gentle practice but you still should be in some short sort of shape and obviously if you have a medical history and you have like a uh, bad back, this could, you know, potentially make that worse, right? Just making sure that you're putting your clients in a way of like them understanding the risk they're going under, that's necessary as well. So when you probably sign up for a gym or you sign up for your yoga studio, you probably in the initial paperwork, when you sign the contract, you're agreeing to these things. Um, sometimes these things are all in one contract. Sometimes they're in separate contracts. That's totally up to the provider and deciding how they want those signed. So Many contracts might probably be, you know, involved in your business and you want to make sure that you have those in place. Mm -hmm. um, and then one last time, how else do people mess up contracts? And by not utilizing best practice clauses. So yeah. once again, going to some online templates we've seen online, um, obviously, <laughs> but uh, these will probably sometimes have the very basic clauses in them. What are the services? You know, what are, what's the payment? And then maybe some boilerplate provisions in yeah. there as well. Um, but there's a lot of other, you know, important clauses that is probably best practice for your industry or just best practice in general for like, for example, creative contracts yeah. or maybe construction contracts, right? Each industry and each type of role you play will have different best practice clauses. And we just wanted to take a quick moment and talk about some of our favorite best practices. Yeah. Clauses. Yeah. And, and again, w as far as the, you know, the, the specific clauses too, um, you know, they don't need to be also, you know written in legalese where you know it's 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 really you know 
confusing, right? We pride ourselves on making sure that our contracts are super legible for anybody, right? So both parties are clear and they have an understanding of what's going on. And sometimes adding some of these clauses, again, doesn't have to be this whole drafted out, you know, paragraph. It could literally be a sentence um, as long as it's it's conveying the message, it's conveying the expectation. That's all that's required. Yeah. So going into some of the ones, you know, that we all often suggest our clients include, uh, Gabe already mentioned this one, but a non-satisfaction clause. A non-satisfaction clause, especially if you're a creator, basically says like, hey, if I'm creating a graphic design for you, right, I'm creating art for you and art subjective. Just because you don't like the art at the end of the day doesn't mean you don't pay me for the performance that you like you agreed for me to do, right? Um, so you paid me to create a design for you. You didn't create pay me to create a design that would be, you know, guaranteeing your satisfaction of it, right? So um, this might also happen with, you know, if you're a photographer and you're taking photos and people just don't want to pay you just because they didn't like the way the photos came out. Oh. Guess what? Like, you know, they have the opportunity to look at your portfolio. They had the opportunity to see the work you've previously done and get an understanding of your style of photo taking that, guess what? If they decided to engage with you, that's on them, right? They took that risk by working with you and, you know, you provide as much information up front about the type of work you do that if they don't like it at the end of the day, you can't help that. They still owe you the money for at least performing that. Yeah. So that's an important clause to include. Also, a boundaries clause is very important these days, right? If you're a virtual assistant, especially, or if you're a service provider like us, um, obviously being able to state, hey, this is what I'm on the clock, even though I'm virtual, right? And you know, I can't guarantee that because you sent me an email at 1 a.m. last night that you're going to hear back to, from me at 6 a.m. this morning, right? That's just unreasonable. Um, so boundaries clause allows you the opportunity to say, hey, my schedule is 9 to 6, Monday through Friday. Um, I don't work on the weekends. I don't work on, you know, basically holidays. Um, this needs to be communicated because maybe you come from a back, maybe you were nine to five all the time. You just understand like that's how everyone works. Well, not everyone does work like that. And some people have unrealistic expectations. Um, and we want to make sure that people understand, Hey, it might take me up to 72 hours to get back to you just because I am a busy person. I'll try to get back to you within 48 hours, but just because you didn't hear back from me in two days, doesn't mean that I'm in breach of the contract. Um, it just means that I still have enough time to get back to you. So yeah. um, that's important to basically lay out um, to make sure that your clients understand, uh, you know, your own personal boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. The promotional release clause, that's also a very important one. Um, and we, you know, we deal with that one a lot of the time because again, there's, there's, there should be certain boundaries or both parties need to agree um, if they're going to promote their relationship, you know, whether it's online or, or however, right? A lot of times um, with artists, it comes in this sense of, hey, I'm going to provide this work for you, but I want to use it in my portfolio. You know, even just things like that, being able to, to set those those standards and say, all right, you know, this is how you're going to be able to, to basically promote our relationship. This is how I'm going to promote the work that I'm doing for you. Um, and again, just getting those permissions up front is going to be so much better than later down the line. You, you know, you post this cool picture that you did for your, your your client, and all of a sudden your client's like, "Whoa, wait a second! Like, I didn't give you permission to to post any of that, right?" So make sure that they there's clauses addressing that. Yeah. Especially because many freelancers, like we all, you know, promote our businesses on social media. And if you ever want to do a client shout out mm -hmm. or a client spotlight or share anything about a client that you did work for, mm -hmm. you want to make sure that you have the permission from them expressly in a contract saying like, Hey, I can say I worked with you, right? I can put your little logo maybe on my website and say like people I've worked with, right? Um, that's going to be involved in that promotional release. So you can basically commercially promote your own business by using maybe their trademarks or their name or their likeness, right? Mm -hmm. So this happens a lot. And if yeah. you don't have that, technically, you're not allowed to just post someone on your not business website, right? Or on your business social Instagram. media. Yeah. Yeah. And then the code of conduct, obviously, you know, you want to establish that code of conduct early on as well, right? Um, you know, I'm sure we've all dealt with, with kind of the, the one client, you know, here and there that just kind of kind of reckless, right? Or, or it's sometimes just a jerk, right? I mean, they just 
they don't conduct themselves in a professional manner. And sometimes when it's a big collaboration project, when there's multiple people, you know, working on something, um, code of conduct is very important, right? Making sure that, hey, look, um, if, if there is going to be an event, you got to make sure you're, you know, you're dressed appropriately, that you're, you're, you know, conducting yourself in a professional manner, that you're going to be there at, you know, on time. Um, you're going to clean up after yourself. Even just like basic little things like that um, are really, really important, um, especially like this says, right? Like if you are hosting workshops, work uh, retreats and things like that, you want to make sure that there's, there's a code of conduct there, right? Because, you know, if you're dealing with 10 individuals, you know, you, you don't have time to be kind of babysitting each one. You want to make sure that they all conduct themselves uh, same. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it just gives you the power to, to enforce something, right? If you host an online community space, right, or a group coaching program, um, there might be a Facebook group everyone's involved in, or, you know, maybe a mighty network or anywhere where people can communicate with each other that's in that program. You want to basically say like, hey, you know, you promise not to harass anyone. You pro promise not to be a jerk. <laughs> you know, you promise not to, uh, because if we need to kick you out because you're making someone else feel unsafe or anything like that, or you're, you know, you can also say like, you no know, soliciting in here, right? Like, don't just like advertise your business in here at, at free will. That's not what this is meant for. Uh, you want to set those rules up. And that way, if something does happen like that, you can just say, hey, um, Gabe, I noticed like you're promoting your business in here. Unfortunately, we don't allow that. And that's pursuant to the contract you sign. Oh. And that makes it easier to say like, Hey, I'm just like picking on you, Gabe. Right. You know, this is an objective code of conduct that we agreed to and everyone agreed to in this group. Yeah. Um, so it just gives you that, that ability to do so. Yeah. So, you know, or just like maybe taking the content you're posting in there and sharing it on a third party website as their own, right? That's copyright infringement. And you also want to say like, Hey, if we need to kick you out because you're stealing our content, putting it somewhere else, you know, you already agreed to not doing that or, no you know, basically, you know, pirating anyone else's, else's information and sharing it in our community or anything like that. So that's important. And then yeah. finally, clients actions, actions and omissions is one of my favorite clauses. That's basically saying, um, hey, I'm the service provider. And if I need information from you, or I need access to your facility, and you block me or you prevent me from doing my bit like the job I'm contractually obligated to provide you, it's not my fault, because I'm ready, willing and able to provide that. It's your fault, right? So if I'm not meeting the deadlines or I can't do the job I'm contracted to do with you because you're preventing me from doing it by your actions or your omissions, then it's not my fault. It's your fault. Yeah. So that's, that's an important clause to have. And that's huge for creators because, again, sometimes maybe there is in the contract some type of agreement that they have to approve certain things at certain time frames, right? Well, you send them the draft. You send them to them according to the contract. They're supposed to respond, you know, and, and give you a thumbs up or thumbs down or whatever edits you need to do. And all of a sudden you send it to them. You haven't heard, you know, in a week and you're like, well, like timelines are gone. And at one point, if they don't answer, then it's not your fault if you keep on going forward with the project, right? And again, that could be addressed in the contract. We're saying if if there is no response, right? If there is an omission of, of response there, then it can be construed as approval. So again, all that could be laid out in that little clause and you know, it just make your life so much easier. Yeah, especially like whether you're a content creator doing like a brand deal or whatever it may be, or even you're a photographer and you send over you know, con you know, photos for approval with the revisions. If you don't hear back with your client within two weeks, well, then you should be able to make final delivery yeah. of those and say like, hey, I didn't hear back from you. I'm guessing like based on the contract it says like, if you don't, if I don't hear back from you, that means that you've acquiesced and approved it. So here's the final delivery. And then, yeah, great doing business with you. Well, I'm going <laughs> to see you next time, right? So that just gives you that power to do that. So that's a few of our favorite contract yeah. clauses. So yeah. In conclusion, this kind of wraps up our discussion for today, but what we want you to take from this is basically that contracts aren't something you should be cringe at or be afraid of, um, but embrace them. Because one, it makes you come off as professional. It makes you come off as like on top of your stuff. And it makes you also just better protect yourself and make sure you're protecting your client's interests as well. So we really think that it's just 
based on the fact that it's going to save you so much headache down the road by getting these contracts in place um, and utilizing them and not being the client that comes to us saying like, hey, I have this contract in place and there's an issue with the client and I thought this is what my contract was supposed to fix. But then we look at the contract and we're like, this contract sucks. No wonder it's not helping you yeah. or no wonder it doesn't give us the ability to do anything for you. Right. Um, is because it just wasn't like drafted well enough. So. Right. And I think the one thing that I, I wanted to point out that I'm sure a lot of you are probably are like, wait a second, when are we going to talk about payment? Right. Because I, I'm pretty sure that's a very common thing, right? Not getting paid. Right. Um, we didn't add that slide because every single situation is going to be different and you can't overgeneralize that. Right. Because again, the, the the payment timeline and all that is going to depend on whether there's a contract, the performance of the work, um, and there's so many little little things that that can play into that. Um, so if you are having obviously you know problems getting paid, um, it's it's not going to be addressed in this just general conversation. But definitely um, you know you could always reach out to obviously the the union uh, i know they they have a lot of great information about that and obviously they're they're working really hard which we love um that they're they're advocating for for laws to be passed in you know in every city to help creators and and freelancers get paid um but also just reaching out um on individual situations to um to attorneys right because like i said every single situation is going to be different Great. And yeah, that's kind of wraps up our plan discussion. Um, we now move into the Q&A portion. Uh, so, you know, if you have any questions, drop them in the chat. Um, we also included some of our um, information about how to reach out to us um, on our socials. So it's at, at Info Law Group um, on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube. Um, but also if you want to just directly reach out on our website, it's www.iminflow.com. Uh, so yeah. Looking forward to any good questions out there. Awesome. Thanks so much. I learned so much um, from this presentation, like all the clauses. Uh, I definitely did not know all of those. <laughs> but um, but yeah, let me pull up some questions. Um, here we go. Here's the first one. So do you have any specific resources or tools that you'd recommend for freelancers to streamline the contract creation and management process? while ensuring legal compliance and thorough documentation. Yeah, I well, yeah, I get, so I I think with that situation it it, it kind of goes back to what Ray was saying about having multiple contracts. And I think by having multiple contracts for different scenarios that helps streamline that situation because again, instead of going back and forth and redrafting, you know, between the parties, you probably already have one that's very specific to that situation. Um, so I would personally say that the best way to streamline that would be to have a little arsenal of, of, of contracts, right? And by, by having multiple contracts, you could also implement certain things from different contracts into one, right? Um, especially like, let's say you had an NDA completely separate and you have an independent um, contractor agreement, but guess what? If there's sensitive information that you don't want that independent contract relationship to, you know, to leak, then you probably want to incorporate that NDA or have them sign both, right? Mm -hmm. And that kind of streams like that, that relationship as well. And to add on, just like as far as a tool, um, I would probably say like any CRM probably has some type of capability for contract generation, um, depending on, you know, which one. Sometimes they have their own contracts, but you don't want to use their own contracts because they're so like... They don't know what business you're providing. Um, they are very broad. Yeah, they're very broad and they're not real. I don't even think they're like even written by lawyers. But um, you want to make sure that you're using your own contracts that you've like invested time and you know putting energy into or you know paying an attorney to help you write. Um, but then using the basically the the ability of Dubsado or HoneyBook to basically automate your documentation, right? So if you have an intake form. You can say like, hey, like client, like what are you interested in? Oh, they can check off that they're interested in this. This is what, you know, whatever, right? Your intake form will basically take all that information and then automatically throw it into your contract with their, their private information, their personal information, whatever it may be, as well as the services they're asking you to provide. And then you can just like look at this contract that's already been drafted, like basically auto-populated for you based on the template you put into the system and then 
finalize it from there or adjust it if necessary. So that's always going to be a good tool. Um, and then obviously management, it's a little different, difficult because I can't really tell like, you know, everyone manages their contracts differently because of when contracts are terming out and things like that. Um, it just comes down to like being on top of, you know, maybe you have your own calendaring system or maybe these tools also, you know, log in like when the termination date may be. And then like when it might be up for renewal or discussions on renewal and things like that. So. Got it. Helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Another question we have. Could you provide examples of how freelancers can use contracts to establish clear project milestones and deadlines and what resource recourse they have if these are not met by the client? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly what we we're talking about. These you know, the, the clauses, especially in the services section, right? What, what you're going to provide. It's mm -hmm. always good to throw in timelines in there. Um, you could throw in timelines in the services and the deliverables, right? Even in each one as, as you're creating, you know, bullet points, right? Because that's what we do. A lot of the times with our clients, we're drafting up contracts for them, but we ask them for bullet points of what their services include. And sometimes even just like a sub bullet saying, you know, here's the milestone here's what we're gonna you know there's the date that this is gonna be required to be finished um and then the recourse is obviously of not doing it again you could lay that that expectation out let's say in the payment section right it says you know let's just let's just pretend it's a long-term project and it says you know every month you're gonna be we're getting hit these milestones and i'm gonna get paid a certain amount of money per milestone right well, you're going to write that. You're going to start it in March. By April, you know, 10th is going to be the first payment. Little next section is going to say, what happens if you're late? Well, mm -hmm. if you're late, you're going to pay me 10%, you know, per day mm -hmm. uh, for a late fee. Or you could do like a standard late fee, you know, um, until. What is, what is the standard late fee? I'm curious. There, There isn't. Oh. <laughs> you, you put whatever you want. If yeah. you. It, you could even say it's not, there is no late fee. If they don't pay it, it could be a breach of contract. And then they, you know, they're in breach. But obviously it's always better to to establish those timelines. Um, and again, it's always just to be able to point back to it. Um, it's, but yeah, I'm sure everyone's dealt with it where you're emailing and like, hey, like I haven't been paid. I finished the project. I sent it to you on this day and we're waiting to get paid. Well, yeah. You could point to a date on the contract and say, hey, on the contract, it says on this date, net 30, right? Net 30 is probably the most popular, you know, yeah. term yeah. that we hear. Yeah. A lot of the times, unfortunately, companies, they kind of just say, well, net 30 doesn't mean anything to us. We're going to pay you after you invoice and after we receive it and after accounting approves it and this and that. No, it, if, if it's net 30, then be more specific. And if it's not paid by the 30th date, then interest is going to start occurring. So, yeah, that's great. Um, okay. Let's see what other questions we have here. Okay. So what legal implications should freelancers consider when entering into contracts with clients located in different jurisdictions or countries? Yeah. So that's a good question, right? So we always recommend having contracts in general, right? Um, the implications come in, right? Just because you're going to put yourself and the client on the same page and have like expectations laid out. Right. Obviously, there comes an issue sometimes with enforcement because if your client is in a different state, there's already just jurisdictional act, like issues with like trying to enforce that contract, right? So the hope is that everyone, you know, basically pursues their end of the bargain, but what happens if they don't, right? This is just a risk you take by working with someone in a different state. Because if you need to enforce a contract, even though you say, you might say in the contract, like, hey, if I need to sue you, I'll sue you in my home jurisdiction, right? And you can try that. But sometimes, even if you try suing someone in your own jurisdiction, in your own like small claims court, that court might say like, hey, we don't have the, you know, we can't really pull this person into our jurisdiction, right? Um, you need to go sue them over there. That might be what that court decides. Like, hey, we're not going to rule on this today. Go sue them in Green Bay, Wisconsin, right where they're at. Um, and then you have to do that, right? That might be what you have to do. But that's just a risk of working with someone in a different state. That's why you want to avoid having to do that. But it still doesn't mean that you should not have a contract with them. 
yeah. right? You should absolutely still have a contract with them because you still want to be able to prove and be able to have that option if you need to sue them or at least like Correct. feign that you're going to sue them yeah. because you don't actually have to show up. You can always have someone else appear yeah. for you, right? But um, yeah, that's and kind of the issue sometimes, especially in foreign situations. Foreign, yeah, that's what I was going to say with foreign foreign clients are even harder, right? Because not only is the jurisdiction now completely out of the United States, right? Mm -hmm. um, most of the time, those contracts are not going to be enforceable, first of all. Um, and second of all, even if they were, it's almost just practically impossible for either you to go to their home country to go litigate it or have them pulled to, to the United States to litigate it. So we always tell our clients, you know, proceed with caution when it comes to um, any contract that's overseas or just in another country. We get a lot of, you know, clients working with Canadian companies and stuff like that. And again, there, there's agreements between certain countries that, you know, you maybe you can enforce, especially when it comes to intellectual property, you might be able to, to still enforce. But even just think about the practicality of it, right? If they're not going to come to the United States, you can't pull them to the United States. You're going to have to go to Canada to go sue them, even just the money to spend on hotels, on attorneys, mm -hmm. on everything to litigate it up there is going to be, might not be worth it. Right. So, yeah. and that sounds scary, but also like that's worst case scenario, right. right? Sometimes you can pull them in, right. If they reach out to you and they want to do business in your state, yep. right. They establish what we call minimum contacts in that state. Yep. And then you can sue them. If they don't show up, that's on them. You can get a default judgment against them and then, have a debt collector go after them. So yeah. there's still like obviously ways to enforce it. It's just, we can't mm -hmm. give like a flat rate answer saying like, yeah. oh, you can absolutely sue them or right. you can absolutely not, right? Um, so it just depends on the circumstances. And that's why in that situation, you always want to consult an attorney just to be like, hey, no. what are my options right now? This yeah. is what happened. Um, so yeah, but obviously if you're going to work with someone even out of state or out of country, it's even more <laughs> important to have a contract in place um, because of that difficulty of like the enforcement issues. Yeah, definitely. That's super helpful. Um, okay, we'll take one last question. Okay, so kind of, I guess this kind of goes back to what we talked about a little earlier, but can you provide examples of common types of contract breaches that freelancers and maybe more creative freelancers, since that's kind of like your um, kind of a clientele may encounter and how these situations are typically resolved through legal channels. Yeah. Yeah. I think payment is probably the most common, right? And I'm sure, you know, you guys are very well aware of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, payment is, is the, the, the biggest obstacle. Um, sometimes there's just no rhyme or reason why, right? It's like, they just don't want to pay or they make these excuses or just dragging on. Um, as long as there's a contract in place, as long as there's timelines, as long as there's, you know, a clear, you know, expectation of the deliverables and the, and the payment, um, then the, the resolution would be to, to escalate it. Right. So we usually like to guide our clients through the escalation process. Hey, first start reaching out even in a polite way. Right. Hey, you know, we finished this job, you know, waiting for the payment. Let me know if you need anything from my side. Let me, you know, if I'm missing something, like, let me know. And then escalate it, right? The next one's a little bit more stern and be like, well, if you, you know, we have a contract and it does say here that it's, you know, 30 days after deliverables, here's the evidence that I delivered whatever, you know, the, the contract is for on this day please, I'll give you until next week on this day to, you know, fulfill um, before escalating it. All right. And then we escalate it, right? The next one should be if you have attorneys, right? Which I think that's one of the, one of the benefits of having like, you know, like the subscription model with us is that CCing the attorneys is such a powerful word, right? And it's such a powerful sentence in an email because once you get to that escalation process, um, you know, Again, you could say, here's the contract. Here's the evidence that I've sent. You haven't paid me at this point. I've emailed you three different times. You haven't responded. My my attorneys are CC'd on here. I'm giving you 48 hours to pay me. You know, and then again, and then once it gets to that point, then the attorneys could get involved, right? Hey, based on this contract, you are in breach. 
our client is going to, you know, pursue legal action unless you're going to pay. And, and again, it's that escalation process. Once it gets to that point where they're still not paying, then us as attorneys, we normally have the conversation with our clients of, well, what are the next steps? Well, the next step is probably going to be a demand letter, right? Um, and that's kind of a lower level, um, uh, you know, way to resolve it. But then after that, it's actually filing a lawsuit, whether that's in small claims or in civil court. Um, and then once they get served with those documents, I mean, at that point, if if they're still not you know complying, then you probably need to go to, to trial and actually go and, and fight the, the contract. But again, those are before it even gets there, definitely mm -hmm. you have to talk to an attorney um, just so you understand kind of the, the process, the procedures, sometimes the cost, right? Um, if it's even worth pursuing it. Um, but yeah, there's, there's ways to escalate it. Yeah. And a sneaky one, uh, like another sneaky kind of like um, common breach I wanted to mention is especially if you're like a agency or mm -hmm. someone who's hiring contractors yeah. to help you create an asset that you're basically passing on to your client. Um, you want to make sure that your contractors are agreeing to what's called like a warranties and representations clause. And that basically representing that, you know, if they created something and they're saying like, hey, this is original, they're promising that's original. That way, when you hand it to your client, and your client gets in trouble for, I don't know, like copyright infringement, because obviously maybe that contractor might have stolen it from someone. Maybe they just didn't do enough like work to make sure that they're not recreating someone else's work. Um, that client's going to be pissed at you because you probably <laughs> weren't to them that your work is original. So obviously you want to then be able to have that recourse against your contractor saying like, hey, what the heck, you're, you're the one in trouble. Like you're the one who caused this issue. Um, and they probably, it's like an indemnification, there should be an indemnification clause in the contractor agreement saying like, Hey, if for any reason your negligence or your mistakes lead to me getting in trouble, you're agreeing to basically taking the fall. Right. So this is how, like, when you're working with different relationships, you want to make sure you're covering your own self, um, in your client's contract, but also with you as the client to your contractor as well. Or subcontractor. Yeah. Oh yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And like the subcontractor, right. not doing original work and then you getting the brunt of the repercussions is definitely something that they have to think about when you're in that position. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. This has been super informative and like very detailed. I love all the, all like the clauses and specifics that we can dive into more if you wanted to look up and look that up and everything. But I guess one last thing is like, I guess you, you mentioned a little bit, like how do people work with you? You mentioned a subscription model. Um, can you go into a little bit more and before we kind of close things up? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, like I said, we, our law firm is geared towards bridging that gap between, you know, creators and, and legal services. So there's two different ways to work with us. Uh, we work on flat fee basis, right? So if you wanted us to create a contract for you, for your specific way of doing business, um, you know, you can reach out, we can quote you on that and then we'll draft the contract hand it over, show you how to use it. Um, and then that's it. Right. Or if you want us to help you, you know, file your LLC or something like that, we could quote you for that single project and then um, do that for you. Uh, the second way to do it is um, we're kind of innovative in that sense that I think at this point, we probably are the only law firm um, in the United States doing it, at least at that price point. Um, we have a $79 subscription model. And that subscription model is really geared towards really empowering our clients, right? Making sure that they feel um, that they have a team of attorneys behind them. So with that subscription model, it's $79 a month, but we have unlimited consultations with us. So anytime any issue comes up or any questions come up, you have you know the ability to schedule call, email us, call us, however you want to communicate to us. That way we can give you proactive advice to kind of nip it in the butt, right? So before it, it gets to a, a, a worse situation. Uh, we have unlimited document reviews, which is probably um, the best um, kind of option for, for creators and, and freelancers because as you're getting these contracts, you know, you could have peace of mind sending them to us. We'll review them. We'll redline some red flags. We'll point out some stuff that's missing. That way you could 
start that conversation with your, you know, with the contractor um, or the, the person contracting you to make sure that all those things are addressed in their contract, right? So it's unlimited consultations with us, unlimited document reviews. Um, we have a hub for all our clients where you're going to be able to find free templates. We have a template library that's going to have NDAs, terms of use, um, you know, privacy policies, independent contractor agreements. We have a bunch of resources for our clients to just grab for free. They could modify them and then they could always send them back because we have unlimited document reviews. They can send them back to us to make sure that they filled them out correctly. Um, and then finally, I mean, one of the, the, the best parts of it is that if you are in the subscription, um, you get 15% off any flat fee service that's outside of the subscription. So let's say you wanted to trademark your brand or you wanted something customized, like something, you know, a contract from scratch, you get 15% off for being a, a subscriber. So, yeah. And the whole idea there, just like we mentioned in the beginning of our, our chat was just the fact of helping freelancers and basically creative entrepreneurs once again, kind of um, level the scales there when working with sometimes their bigger clients, right? Um, those bigger clients have in-house counsel. They have you know, resources with outside counsel to help them come up with these contracts and negotiate these deals for them against mm -hmm. you, right? Who's just like sometimes on your own, David and, and Goliath. And we basically wanted to um, help creators like leverage and create a, like fair grounds there. Yeah. Um, so we mentioned contracts are a way, but also having like a team of attorneys. And that's why we came up with the idea of like, how can we create like a long standing relationship with our clients? Not so that's just transactional where they just come to us and, you know, you know, can we have a contract? We create a contract for them and then just like, they're off on their merry way, trying to enforce it and making sure they're implementing it the correct way, but being there and holding their hand along the way and basically being able to, you know, as Gabe mentioned, just being able to say like, Hey, my attorneys are CC'd on this email. So I'm ready to take the next step when you are just like, you know, give me a reason to, right. Even if you're, even if we already discussed, like we probably won't escalate mm -hmm. any further than that, that's enough for the client to be like, Oh gosh, like I really don't want to make this an issue, like a bigger issue. So I'm just going to pay them now. So. Yeah. And one of the the things that I'm sure there's going to be a follow-up question on that is like, is there a long-term commitment for that subscription? And early on Ray and I decided that we didn't want our clients to be, you know, handcuffed to us, you know, for a year or whatever, if they didn't want to be. So our, our service is month to month. So it's as long as they're finding, um, you know, some some value in it, um, it keeps us accountable as well to make sure that we're providing that value for our client. Although for seventy nine dollars, you know, it's it's hard to, <laughs> hard to argue that there's no value there. But um, most of our clients stick around for the long term. And it ain't, again, that is the goal. Right. The goal is always for us to be part of the team, um, not just transactional attorneys that just flip clients like that. We want to be in it for the long term with, with our clients. So that's why we decided to do it such, such a low price for $79. And that's why we don't do yearly commitments um, because we know, you know, we're confident in what we offer and we're very proud of the work that we're doing and, you know, what we're trying to, that gap we're trying to bridge. And we hope our clients see that as well. So. Yeah, well, thank you so much for taking the time to guide our members on how to best approach contracts and agreements and sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. Um, all the appropriate links are down below in the description here. So if you need any more help or information, you can refer to that. And then be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel and newsletter for all updates and future events here at Freelancers Union. Um, hope you, we see you at the next event. And thanks so much. Thank you for having us. Yeah.